uh, Matthew 26, and we're going to read verses 36 to 46. And I want to speak this morning on the power of sacrifice for forgiveness. We have the privilege of being forgiven. And we, I, don't believe, I don't believe we understand the, what God has done for us. And so maybe you're not going to see it in the passage, but I'll present it to you this morning. So reading from verse 36 in Matthew 26, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Sounds like when we speak to our children, isn't it? You sit here, I'm going over there. And they behaved like children. They went to sleep. But, and, uh, and taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he, a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. <clears throat> just think if Jesus had not spent that time in the garden of Gethsemane praying and what I believe battling with God over what was to be done if he hadn't sacrificed or if he had gone to the cross but not allowed the sacrifice upon the cross none of us would be forgiven not one And what implications would that have for you and I this morning? Friday, I think I mentioned, or somewhere I mentioned, maybe the week before, about the writing here is finished. What is finished? That which has separated us from God has been removed. It is finished. And God can forgive through the sacrifice of Jesus. But much in the same way if the Lord had gone to the cross but not allowed himself to be sacrificed upon the cross, how often do we come to church but we leave the sacrifice of ourselves at home and we continue in the same vein as we did when we were in the world. Isn't that an unforgiving heart? <coughs> you see, what I see from Jesus in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when you, and you wonder, well, what's this got to do forgive, with forgiveness? Jesus praying. See, the Lord didn't want to carry the cup from the physical pain side and the, and the spiritual pain that he would experience upon the cross. He knew what was coming. Why do you think he cried out to the Lord, to the, to the Father and say, why have you forsaken me? Because the pain that he would carry. And he could see it from two sides. From God's side and from the earthly side. The necessity of it, the requirement of it, but he could see the heartache and pain that would come with it. And you know that 
The crucifixion was not an accident. Hmm? The nails didn't fall from the sky and go through his hands by accident. It was an intentional thing that Jesus did, putting himself upon the cross. And life needs to be intentional. And so, what is it that I, I see in this, this, this prayer of Jesus and, and, and what I understand from forgiveness? Because that's what I would like to look at this morning, is this, this thought of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a process. We, and, and you know me, I've, I've told you before. I'm not one of those pastors who teaches the five or six or twelve steps to redemption and the, and the five steps to that. And the, and the, why? Because that's, that's an AA, worldly program. That's a program that somebody made up and said, if you follow these guidelines, that's why whenever I see these things, people send out messages, if you follow these steps. No. Oh. <laughs> you see, we live by the Spirit. Amen. And it's God who, who, whose light lights my steps. He lights the way for me ahead. And He only reveals one step at a time for me as I'm moving forward. Because he knows if he put too many steps, I might look ahead and say, uh-uh, that's but too much for me. But Jesus knows what's coming. He already understands the pain, the significance. He understands it from both sides. And for me, forgiveness is not this process, but it's a battle that all of us must enter into willingly and intentionally. See, because why I mention the fact that we leave our, our sacrificial self at home is the sense is even when we come into the presence of God and we come to sing, we don't come and praise God from an overflowing heart. We wait for those who are in the front to lead us into worship. Have you ever thought of that? That we come here into the presence of God as a family of God to worship God in song, in voice, and how often we wait for the right song to be led into that presence of the Lord and only then do we begin to warm up and start to praise Him. We leave ourselves at home, that part which God once nailed to the cross as a sacrifice unto Him, we leave it at home. That's for when I go home and I switch the TV on and the soccer comes on or the rugby or whatever it is and I sit before the TV and I shout with abundance and joy and come on, whatever it is, and I leave that all at home. Have you ever thought about that? Why are we so free in the presence of worldly people and yet in the presence of God and in His people we're so bound up and tight? We leave the things that God wants at home. And we only bring the part that we think is right. Do you know that God wants that brokenness, that hopelessness here? And when I think of, of Jesus before the cross, and I'm thinking, and, he, and, and I mean, in Gethsemane, before he enters into going to the cross. And I think of this battle that he has. What is the battle for? You know, the battle is for you and I. Because, because God required from him his life for you and I. And I wonder, when I think of that battle, and I, and I, I made some notes around this thing, because... <clears throat> If the cross was no accident, then you coming to the Lord needs to be intentional and not accidental. Your life needs to be intentional and not accidental. In other words, maybe I'm in the right place at the right time, and maybe God will do something. No. You, you go with the right heart and right intention, and God will do something. You, you see, there's a, there's a different focus in life. And, and what the cross teaches us you see, the work of the cross is forgiveness. There's much more. But for this message, the work of the cross is forgiveness. But the grace of the cross 
allows you to know that God will give you the power Amen. to forgive. Amen. We, we, we seem to think that forgiveness is something that, that just falls upon us sometime if we're in the right place at the right time, in the right spirit, and then always, oh, I'll forgive you. Well, I don't see that from Jesus. See, Jesus knew what he was doing was the work of redemption. And it needed, needed an overall forgiveness for you and I to be able to be forgiven. And I see Jesus wrestling with God, and I've been told, no, you don't wrestle with God in prayer. I understand you can wrestle with God in prayer. Because when things are not right and you want to know God's will, you wrestle with God for an understanding of what God wants. And this is what I see Jesus, because he went once, he went twice, he went three times. Is that not wrestling with God? Do you think after the first time that Jesus did not know God's will? He knew God's will before he went in the garden. And I wonder, what was this battle of his? And I made some points. And I just, you know, the very first point I think of what maybe that Jesus was battling with is, and we don't have all the words that he spoke to the Father. But if it was me praying and I had to do this, the very first thing I'd say, Lord, these people are unworthy. Father, you want me to die for these people and they are so unworthy. Look at the children that I've just posted out there to say to wait there and watch. They're sleeping. How worthy should they be counted? And isn't that the battle that we have in life? And I want to compare Jesus' battle to much of what we have in life. The battles that we go through that I, I would believe that Jesus had in his heart as well. See, those people that, that, that as far as we would consider not worthy to be forgiven, they didn't even know they needed to be forgiven. When Jesus preached the gospel, they thought they knew better than him. When Jesus healed, well, no, who's he healing in what name? Must be, he, he's casting out demons in the name of Satan. You, you understand, these are people that couldn't even recognize the truth when it stood before them. And Jesus has to die for a people that don't even know they need to be forgiven. Hmm? And so often, we walk in the flesh just as the Pharisee did, as they did in those days, and they believed that they were walking in the Spirit of God. Why? Because they were wise. Do you know the same falls upon those who live on earth at this time? Many who believe they walk in the Spirit, but are walking in the flesh. I think last week I mentioned spoke about the shadows that we're constantly living in, the shadows of the past, the things that happened yesterday. We, we, we live in those shadows. We're bound by them. Jesus didn't die on the cross for his children to be bound in the same way as before the cross. He died on the cross to liberate us. And I don't mean woman's love. And, and I don't mean the, 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 the liberation that's going on the world, in the world these days where uh, it's change your sex and change this and do that and uh, don't get married and, and whatever else it is. Just, just fornicate and do the things that you want to do. I'm not talking about that liberation. I'm talking about where your heart is free to come with you to church, to worship the living God.
See, the thing that we need to understand is, is that Jesus didn't just forgive some sin. He forgave murder. He forgave genocide. He forgave rape. He forgave hate. See, he took all the sin upon himself. And there will be people in war-torn Europe at the moment that would say, well, how can we forgive people who have committed these crimes? And that's the battle that we have. You know that that is the battle that we have. How do we reconcile what's going on in this world with the walk that I have to walk? With the life that I have to live? Because in our logic, and that's in our flesh, it's not doable. Cannot do this. Why? You expect me to forgive someone who murdered my child. Yes. They murdered God's child. You've got to understand what this cross does. You've got to understand that the cross doesn't eliminate some things and others remain. It's either all or nothing. And it applies to everyone. Not just some. You can't pick and choose what God asked you to forgive. See, Jesus knew that the wound that he was going to receive on that cross huh, would be devastating. It would be so great, so massive. And the question is, is it really worth it? And yet, John 1 14 and I remind you of this constantly the word became flesh remind Jesus David wrote in the Psalms what did he say God will rescue me Jeremiah wrote God will rescue his people see Jesus trusted his father because why because he knew his father he knew what God would do because what he had done for others, he's going to do for you and he would do for him as well. You understand the concept and this thought that Jesus, although he's battling with forgiveness, he understands that he can trust the Father. And I'm not saying that he's gone there and he said, well, you know what, let's, let's really toss this up and see if I'm going to do it. No, because God sent him because he knew he would complete the task. But what we experience and see is not a, a, a Jesus in second thoughts and having second thoughts about what he would do. No, he's going into the garden and he's showing that just like we are men, he is a man. But yet he's God at the same time. Why? Because he fulfills and accomplishes everything that God has called him to do. Do you know that he is the only one who could fulfill the law? Every letter of the law, Jesus fulfilled. And that's the reason he was righteous. That was the reason he could go on the cross for us. Because he had to be without blemish. And what I see from the place that Jesus was in the garden was that hurt is a lonely place. You know that? He was on his own. Even though he said to his disciples, watch with me, they fell asleep. And this place of, 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 of hurt is a lonely place. It's a place that you will go through on your own. Although there are many around you. And it's a place of not only uh, emotional and uh, uh, spiritual, but it's also a place of physical distress. To the point that it says that Jesus sweated blood. And 
And when I, when we're in this place of loneliness, the decisions that we make will be our own. Jesus didn't go back to the disciples and say to them, what do you guys think? Because he already knew what they would thought. What they thought. No, Lord. This is not for you. Don't leave us. We need you. And often, if you ask people's advice, people's advice would be contrary to what God says about faith. People often make decisions in accordance with walking in the flesh. And they guide you in a similar manner. What would I do in that situation? Well, I'll know. I'll tell you what I would do. If the Lord put me in that situation and said, would you die? No, Lord. I will not take the nails for this unworthy people. Not only that, Lord. Do you know how much pain that you would put me through just to do that? But Lord, beyond that, I'm not worthy to die on the cross. And none of us are. And God knows that. That's why he sent his son. <clears throat> Not only that was Jesus' battle. Do you know that one of the hardest parts of forgiveness is facing those who you have to forgive? Those who hurt you. And I wonder, when Jesus was praying to the Lord, and he could already see what was coming, how, how did he know that, well, here's my betrayer. My time is at hand. Why? Because he foreknew. He knew these things. God had shown him. How did he know he would die? He knew how he would die. So he already knew, and I wonder if one of those aspects of his battle of forgiveness or his battle of prayer with the Lord about forgiving people in this sense is that, Lord, that I need to face those who have attacked and hurt and abused and crucified me. And so often, that's the hardest part that we have when it comes to forgiving in the battle. See, Jesus accepts his fate. Have you ever thought of that, that there was no fight, there was no, um, let me do this, let me, no, no, the time had come. He stood up, he accepted his fate. He accepted the place he had to be in. Listen, you're going to have to hurt me, you're going to have to torture me, you're going to beat me, you're going to nail me to the cross, but I've already forgiven you. Hmm? Have you ever thought that if we came to God's house or we treated people that we came into uh, confrontation with in a similar manner, that we'd have half the battle won before we've even had to start to, begive, to forgive someone? But so often we think just like the world. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You do something to me, and I'm going to get justice. Not once in Jesus' mind, not once do I find anything that he was looking for justice. At the height of his pain, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Hmm? Have you ever thought of that? Someone, and, and just think of it in the sense that someone is beating you, or someone is murdering you, I mean stabbing you with a knife, broken into your house, whatever it may be, something's going on in life, and your first response is, Lord forgive them. Not let me first get justice and beat them and stab them, and Lord give me the power to overcome them, and let me, and once I've done all of this, Lord, I'll forgive them. No, Lord forgive them. And you know, I think the pain that Jesus experienced praying in the sweating blood wasn't just because he had to get on the cross as a one-time deal 
a one-time deal for all. Yes, and we know what Hebrew says that, and Romans and, and the Bible teaches us to say, and that Jesus died once for all. And we understand that. But what I want to say to you this morning is that not only did Jesus have to die on the cross for the forgiveness of the world, but then he had to sit at the right hand of the Father and he watches in pain everyone's sinfulness and unforgiving hearts. That must be the worst of all, that you've done the, you've done the deed, you've done what God asked you to do, and now you sit there and you watch people kill each other, murder, rape. And you turn to the Father and you say, Father, they are forgiven through me. Hmm? What pain that must be for the Lord to experience. And yet, he fulfilled what God asked him to do. See, because the word is written, and the writer of Hebrews quotes out of the book of uh, Jeremiah 31, and in Hebrews 10, 15 to 18, it says, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them in their minds. Then he adds, I'll remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And we remember the writer of Hebrews writes to the Hebrews, quoting out of the book of Jeremiah about God's people. And where there is an offering for these, a once-off offering, there is no longer an offering for sin. Why? Because Jesus did it. And he removed sin, took it away. And you see, we, we have this, this thing that we need to forget to forgive. You'll never forget. This word doesn't say that God will forget. See, what the cross does and what the cross says is that I will no longer hold against you the sin that you committed because you've been forgiven. You see, there's a difference because how can an all-knowing God forget? He can't because he knows everything. He knows everything about you, where you've been, what you've done. He knows the future. He cannot forget. But what forgiveness says is that, listen, I'm forgiving you. Why? Because I won't hold against you what you were. I'm not going to remind you tomorrow, hey, Alan, do you remember last week you did this? Hmm? But Lord, you forgave me. Yes, but I'm still remembering. Hmm? What, sort of, what sort of forgiveness is that? You see, the cross says to me that, Jeff, no matter your sin, before you met me, I won't hold it against you. You will be accountable for the sin you commit now that you know me. There's a difference. But when you confess your sins and repent of your sins, I will hold them against you no more. Hey, how great a God is that? How great is our God? That we are forgiven. Forgiving is not a feeling. You know that you don't feel good when you're forgiven in the sense that, oh, you know what, I've done it, now I'm jumping for joy and it's all happiness. It's a battle. It's a decision. And the question is, what is the limit? What is the limit to forgiveness? Well, God's limit was limitless. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. Other than against the Holy Spirit. That is to reject His Spirit.
See, not rape, not murder, not genocide, not adultery, none of it is unforgivable. God can forgive anything. But may I say to you that forgiveness is not fair. Do you know that? Forgiveness is not fair. But neither was nailing Jesus to the cross. And yet we will all receive the unfairness of the cross. But when it comes to forgiving, we find it unfair. But have you ever thought about it in another sense? That as much as we think of it being unfair, what do you think it was to God, to Jesus in the garden? How fair was it to him? Father, put all the sin of the world upon me. You think that's fair? Shows you how righteous a God we serve. Hmm? There is none like him. None compares to him. So for me, you know, I think I've, I've mentioned the sense, but the, uh, not going to the scriptures, just that we need to settle in our hearts and agree with God what his requirements are for forgiveness. You see, we can't, we can't have what, what Jesus gave us and apply a different method in our forgiveness. Because we're all ready to accept the forgiveness of the cross. We all accept to receive the power of the cross. We're all ready to accept whatever God, free gift that God wants to give to us. But when it comes to us forgiving, the conditions change. Yes, but Lord, you don't know what so and so did to me. Elise, let me remind you of what God did for you on the cross when you say but. Matthew 6, 14 to 15 says, For, you, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It's quite a statement. But it's the next session, next bit. It says, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. See, we need to settle in the, our hearts what is forgiveness. And if this scripture doesn't apply in our lives or, or it's shelved or it's altered or, or we find another translation that suits my requirements, then we have time in the garden of Gethsemane. We need that time in the garden with the Lord, where we battle with the Lord and wrestle to find God's will so that he can change your focus and your, your mentality, your earthly uh, influence into a spiritual influence to understand what forgiveness means in his mind and in his word. And how often do we come to conclusions in our lives where the flesh has decided what forgiveness is? Have you ever thought of that? In our hearts, in our minds, we say, we've forgiven the person. Done. Forgiveness is done for us. <laughs> Measure your forgiveness to the word of God. And maybe like the disciples, you need a little more faith to forgive. Because so often we receive forgiveness according to the Spirit, but we apply forgiveness according to the law. Mm, quiet. I think we've all fallen asleep in the dark. Hmm? See, faith exposes God's plan to you. Faith makes me see what God wants me to see.
Faith gives me the opportunity to see the freedom that is found in forgiveness. That's why the disciples prayed for more faith. Lord, give us more faith. Maybe it's something that we need in our lives is to, a little more faith to see the purpose of forgiveness that God has given to us. Forgiveness for us is offering the same grace to others that God has offered to you. Forgiveness doesn't stop with you. See, forgiveness flowed from Christ through his cross to everyone who would accept him as Lord and Savior. And forgiveness is not something that is meant to stop with you. Forgiveness flows through you to others. You know what? Have you ever experienced the healing of forgiveness? Have you ever experienced that? Where you've held a grudge and you've held something against someone for so long that one day when the Lord really speaks and the Holy Spirit gets in and speaks into your heart and says, you know what, you need to get rid of that. Why? Why? Because one, you can't pray. When you have unforgiveness in your heart, there's no time for prayer. The only prayers you pray is, Lord, help me, Lord, bless me, Lord, give me. That's the prayer, and it's a short prayer, and there's no time in the presence of God. Why? Because your heart's enclosed with unforgiveness. There's bitterness. There's hopelessness. But when the Lord breaks that away, and when that when that. Uh, Forgiving heart breaks through. That forgiving spirit that you have breaks through. Suddenly there's a healing. Like no healing. There's a rejoicing before the Lord. There's a, Lord, a thankfulness before God. Why? Lord, you've opened my eyes. But not only have you done that, you've given me the faith that I might see what this does. But Lord, not only have you given me the faith and opened my eyes, but you've made me experience something that, that is so great and wonderful, Lord. I never knew it was like this until tomorrow. And then I have an unforgiving heart again. And may I say to you that it's not just about a personal thing that happens. Let me ask you, how unforgiving are we to taxi drivers? I'm just those who drive. Hmm? And that's just one little thing. When you get on the road and you see a taxi, you already got an issue with the taxi before he's even done anything. Why? Because that's how he behaves. Well, where's your faith and your forgiveness and where's your sense of, of, of a spiritual walk and, and the goodness of God? Because God forgave him before he did it. He hasn't confessed it and repented, but God has forgiven you see, the forgiveness is not on condition when you do this. No, no. When Jesus died on the cross, it says he died for all, whether you've accepted it or not. And what I'm saying is that, that we have already in our hearts an unforgiving spirit to anyone who behaves in this manner. And it's a blanket thing. We don't go out in the morning and the day with a freedom of expression, a freedom of faith. And when someone does, you say, oh, don't worry, but you're forgiven, man. Hmm? Don't worry about it. Why? Because my heart's not set in that way. My heart is set in the way of justice and righteousness. And it's my own. And what a difference it would be to wake up in the morning and have freedom to pray before the Lord and spend time with the Lord and say, well, Lord, you know what? No matter what happens today, may your name be glorified. Amen. And when that glorification means, Lord, that I carry the forgiveness of Jesus upon the cross, that he who rose, he who sits by you and watches the sin of the world, I carry that forgiveness in my heart. Why? Because it's in faith. It's not in the flesh. 
And so often we carry this unforgiving spirit because it's in the flesh. And it's according to the rule of law. And not in accordance with the rule of spirit. Paul has a thing in Philippians in chapter 3. And I've mentioned this to you before. You can go and read it. And he speaks about that I don't look at the things that are behind. Why? Because when I'm looking behind, my focus is not on the prize that is ahead. And so often when we're looking behind, we're looking at the things that have been done and, and all the negative stuff and the bad things of life. Why? And I've lost focus of who is the prize. Lost focus. And so my focus in losing focus of the prize, I lose focus of the objective. I lose focus of the grace. I lose focus of all aspects of the cross because I'm looking behind constantly. When we're looking ahead, and, and I, I know what you're saying, but pastor, the taxi's in front of me. It's not behind me. That's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking you're looking ahead of the taxi's problem and the issue that he's brought in your life. Why? Because you're living by grace and faith. And before the person does it, you've already extended the hand of grace by faith. The same thing that the cross offers to you and I. And we don't forgive because we have the strength. We don't forgive because it's, it's in us and we're such good people and we say, oh, you know what, I am such a good person, I'm going to forgive you for anything you do to me. That's not how we do it. It's not why we do it. We do it because the Spirit of God dwells in us. Because the Spirit of Christ is alive within us. And therefore we do it by faith and by grace. Not in our strength. Because God wants healing in this world. And you and I are how forgiveness flow through to this world. And I want to remind you that it's not a two-step, five-step or twelve-step program. But it's a battle before the Lord. And it's a battle I take to the Lord. So often, this is a battle that we have in our own hearts and minds and, and souls. And we're battling there. Why? Because we know what God is going to tell us. Forgive. Why? Well, Lord, I don't want to. Let me hold it in my heart a little bit longer. And I'll have a little bit more joy. And I want to encourage you this morning. Let's take the battle to the Lord. This battle that we have of unforgiving hearts and unforgiving spirits, it is the Lord's fight, not ours. If we, if we submit to Him and we, and we repent and confess our sin and, and we express our hurt and our pain and, and the anguish, God will lead us through that. And He will give us the faith to walk. We've got to remember this, that God is our rescuer. God is our redeemer. And when he's accepted you as his child, he's not accepted you on a condition. He's accepted you knowing who you are. Knowing every blemish and every problem in your life. Every little heartfelt moment that you feel, oh, geez, I don't want to do this. God knows. But he wants you to bring it to him in prayer. And he doesn't mind the tussle with you. He doesn't mind you saying, yes, Lord, but. Because he will have an answer. And he'll have the right answer. So let me encourage you this morning. Choose to live the rest of your life for him. When you live it for yourself, you're going to live in unforgiveness. But when you live it for him, it's not going to be a piece of cake. It will be a battle, but it will be to his glory.